we are scheduled to have an exam, and if you look at the course outline that I gave you at the beginning of the semester, it was supposed to be next week. Uh, after we have uh, in the lecture that we were supposed to have tonight, was going to be our exam. But because of last week's cancellation, we're going to bump the exam back to Wednesday, the 11th of March. And that's our last class meeting before spring break. So um, just a bit of background information about the exam. There will be two parts to the test. The first part will be conceptual questions. And those will be some of the vocabulary definitions that I've been pointing you towards. <coughs> It'll be short answers. And on that first part of the exam, you just have to write from memory. There's no notes. You can't use the textbook, no previous assignments. It's just strictly uh, the exam, your pencil, and your brain. Part two is going to be problem solving. And so to prepare for that, you should go through both the in-class exercises that we've solved and also the homework assignments. And on part two, you can prepare an equation sheet. You can put anything you'd like on uh, both sides of the paper. It can be the, uh, the formulas from the, uh, from the homework assignments. It can be, if you'd like, some uh, variable definitions to help you remember what to substitute into the formulas. Really, just anything you like. But you can only use that on the second part of the exam. And so you'll complete the first part of the exam, uh, give it to me, and exchange it for part two. And we'll have, um, I think, the better part of our our class period for that. We'll have some of the time for lecture and some of the time for the exam. So uh, I'll give you a, a few additional details about the test when we meet next Wednesday. Any questions about the test at this point? <coughs> All right, well, I've handed back the homework assignment that I graded. And um, I've posted the solution to uh, homework two on MU Online, and then you've just submitted homework three, and that's on MU Online as well. So I thought I'd pull that up and just point out to you where the homework solutions are, in case you're not already in the habit of looking for it there. And see if there are any questions. All right, so here's homework two solution. And this is the one that I've just handed back that you've, you've already had graded. And um, so does anybody have any questions that you'd like to ask before we get into today's lecture just related to the ideas from homework two, which you just got back? Let's see if we zoom out a little bit. It makes it a bit easier. Remember on this one, we started off talking about <coughs> how many generations of bacteria there had been in a certain amount of time. Um, then based on the mass per cell, you calculate the total mass of the entire colony. Um, and I guess probably the trickiest idea on the homework, the, as I was grading it, the thing that a students seemed to struggle the most on was the idea of mass balance. And so here we, in this box, what we're doing is we're representing a reactor or a control volume where we're going to be keeping track of what goes in and what goes out of this control volume. And what we know from uh, that idea is that the change in COD from in versus out is related to the amount of oxygen that's consumed. And so when we knew that there's a certain amount of casein, which is just a carbohydrate that the, the bacteria inside the reactor are consuming, if there's a certain amount of casein that's being consumed, then we had a yield here of 0.36, which is how many new cells form per gram of casein. And um, so if, if you struggled on the homework assignment, this is posted online. You can review that before the test. And also, the assignment that you've just submitted, the, uh, the key to that is also available if you want. You know, sometimes as soon as you turn it in, it's the freshest in your mind, and that's when you're in the best position to understand the solution. So here you can go through and take a look at uh, how to do that homework. So feel free to stop by my office if you've got questions after taking a look at it. 
So what we're going to be talking about tonight in lecture is attached growth and then uh, nitrification, denitrification. That's sort of the bulk of where we're going to be spending our time tonight. And the in-class exercise that we're doing is related to attached growth. So <clears throat> by attached growth, what we mean is um, someplace that the bacteria are growing. And let's just take a step back and think about what's the whole objective of wastewater treatment. Um, in wastewater treatment, we have some dissolved contaminant that we're trying to remove. Remember, primary treatment is pretty, pretty easy. You know, the primary clarifier, you've got heavy things that sink to the bottom of the clarifier and uh, floatables like grease and oil and foam that goes to the top. And so we scoop the bottom, we scoop the top, and by doing that, remove some of the contaminants. But then what's tricky to remove is the dissolved BOD, the, the oxygen demand that if it gets into the river, it's going to cause um, a, a decrease in oxygen and harm to aquatic life. And so here in what we've been studying so far in suspended growth in an aeration basin, it's called suspended growth because the microorganisms that are doing the treatment are floating around. They're freely floating inside of the tank. You know, a limited number of them have the ability to move on their own. They have motility, but the majority of the bacteria are just, they go where we pump them. And so in return activated sludge, we're activating the aeration basin by pumping in the hungry um, biomass. And it breaks down BOD even faster. So just to compare that suspended growth, which we've already been talking about, to fixed growth, in fixed growth, instead of having microbes floating around inside of a tank, then, and we can return the sludge by pumping it from the secondary clarifier, just to compare that, in fixed growth, the microbes are living on the surface of a media. And so they're attached to rocks. Um, they still do the same thing, though. They're still consuming a substrate, which is the main thing we want them to do. We want them to break down oxygen demand. We want them to consume the pollutant. And of course, as they do that, they require oxygen. And let me dim the lights a bit so we can see this picture better. In fixed growth, instead of having the bacteria floating around inside of a tank, the bacteria are coating the surface of a media. They're on the surface of a rock. Sometimes we use synthetic media like plastic pellets. But water is being sprayed over a packed bed and the water, as it trickles downward through this packed bed, the bacteria that live on the surface of the rocks are reaching out into the water and grabbing some food, essentially. That dissolved substrate, the BOD we want them to remove, um, they're getting it from the water that floats over the surface of the rock, rather than those bugs being floating around inside of the aeration basin. So, it's really important for us to consider what's happening underneath the surface because we can't really see with our eyes where the magic happens in a trickling filter. Um, all we can see is there's a rotating arm that this wastewater is being sprayed over the media, usually rocks. So it's going around in circles trying to distribute the liquid evenly over the surface. But under the, under the surface of the rock, the water is trickling uh, over the surface of these different media and in the voids sometimes there's water and sometimes there's air and one of the really nice advantages of a trickling filter compared to activated sludge is that a large part of the energy requirements that we have to provide electricity for pumping oxygen or stirring it really vigorously to deliver oxygen in here um, we may not have to provide any additional oxygen in a trickling filter. Natural ventilation can be used instead of the uh, diffused air delivery in an activated sludge system. So when it works, it's really a great option, fixed growth, because of the reduced requirements for electricity. So here's a cross-sectional look of just a diagram showing us that at the surface, there's a rotating arm. And sometimes, depending on the, the flow rate that's being delivered, sometimes the rotation of the arm can be driven just by the jet coming out. You know, the water exiting one side of the arm is enough to propel that arm forward. You know, usually they'll put a motor on it just in case they need to continue spinning the rotating arm during low flow delivery. Um, but the, uh, 
The main idea is that the flow coming in has a high concentration of BOD, and the flow coming out will have a lower concentration. Not, not extremely low, but lower. And so uh, it's essentially achieving the same objective, but using a different approach. So let's look at the full process from beginning to end. The raw sewage comes in and it goes through the, uh, the rack or screening to try and remove debris that would uh, damage pumps. The grit chamber is where the heavy particles like sand and broken glass settle down and uh, so a clear liquid leaves the grit chamber and enters the primary set settling tank. And in the primary clarifier, uh, whatever is not dissolved will hopefully settle to the bottom. The majority of what's not dissolved settles to the bottom is sent to uh, digest that sludge. Some of the, uh, the oils and grease are removed off the top. But secondary treatment is where uh, the magic happens. And it's, uh, it's this process in activated sludge, which is where we've spent the bulk of our time so far, where we were recirculating sludge. Uh, in this case, we've, we've replaced the aeration basin with the trickling filter. It's a way of delivering air and providing an environment for the uh, biomass to grow. Um, now, there is recirculation here, but it's for a completely different reason than there was recirculation in an aeration basin for activated sludge. And so just to contrast activated sludge, all right, so in activated sludge secondary treatment, we have the inflow coming from primary treatment, and it's going to the aeration basin. Okay, so in the aeration basin, we're adding a lot of oxygen here. And the flow goes to a clarifier. And then there's overflow from the clarifier. So who can remind us why we were recirculating sludge in activated sludge? What's the purpose of that? All right, very good. So activated means we're taking the biomass that settled in the clarifier, and down at the bottom of the clarifier, that's not a great place to find something to eat. For the, for the microbes that are down there. They're in sort of a, a starved environment. So when we pump that sludge back into the aeration basin, they're in a really good place to start consuming substrate quickly. Now, of course, we have to waste some of the sludge, and that's what this line is. This is the waste sludge. If we didn't have a waste sludge, then the sludge would continue to accumulate inside of secondary treatment. But by introducing that activated sludge in the aeration basin, it consumes substrate much, much more quickly than it otherwise would. So how is that recirculation, where we're recirculating sludge, different from the recirculation here? Right. Yeah, you'll notice we're not recirculating the sludge. So who wants to speculate why that might be? Why are we recirculating the uh, the effluent from the secondary clarifier instead of the digested, uh, instead of the, the sludge. Why recirculate clean water instead of sludge? If, if I asked you to speculate, you can take wild stabs in the dark on this one. That's a really good point. You know, sludge is thick. It has high concentration of solids. Over here, when we are taking the, uh, the biomass and recirculating it, there could be concentrations as high as 5,000 milligrams per liter. And so remember, this is a, a filter media, and we don't want to be pouring sludge over the filter media. So that's definitely part of it. But that's not all of it. There are other, there are other aspects as well. Remember that uh, when we recirculate the sludge, what we're really circulating is the biomass. Where's the biomass here? 
Yeah, the biomass is on the surface of the rocks. It's like a scum layer that forms on the surface of the rocks. And so we don't have to recirculate the sludge to get biomass in the trickling filter. The, the biomass is naturally living in the trickling filter without us having to add it. And it's going to stay there because the water that comes through there is naturally separate from the biomass. Here in an aeration basin, when we suck water out of the aeration basin, we're sucking out the water and the biomass in equal measure. They're, they're all mixed in together. But here, the water and the biomass are naturally kept separate. So, you know, that's another, another point of it is that, you know, we don't recirculate this, the sludge because we don't have to, and it would be bad operationally. But then there's one, there's one last aspect of it, and that is that in a single pass, the trickling filter doesn't take out that much. It only takes out a little bit of BOD each time, and so we have to send it through many different round trips. It, you know, the, the water has to go through one time, then two times, then three times. It has to actually recirculate several times before it's removed enough of the mass that we can take a portion of that water out and, uh, and waste it finally to our receiving body. And so we'll talk about why is the trickling filter not so effective and why that forces us to recirculate it multiple times. But, you know, in a conceptual question where you're giving a short answer, just to give you an idea of exams, I may ask you to compare recirculation in activated sludge with recirculation in uh, trickling filter. And so explain the differences. Explain the difference in the purpose, the difference in operations, and, uh, and so that covers some of the things that we've been talking about. Any questions about this process overview? By the way, did you get a copy of the notes? Everybody else have the notes? Okay. So let's just look at the media. Um, like I mentioned before, sort of the, uh, the traditional, the old school way of having a trickling filter is it's just rocks, like actual stones, and they're circular-ish. They're kind of irregular, but uh, usually 25 to 100 millimeters in diameter. Now, more recently, it's become common to use plastic media, uh, like basically exchange the rock for plastic. And you can see this plastic media, they've drilled holes in it. And uh, I've got some media back in my office. After we take our quick break, I'll bring it in to show it to you. you we can all pass it around. It's, some of it's been used, some of it hasn't been used, but it's, it's all safe, it's been cleaned. Nobody will get sick. But, um, so why do you suppose we've made the shift from like rocks to plastic pellets? Any ideas on why there would be an operational advantage to using plastic instead of rocks? Okay, yeah, it could be cheaper. Easy to remove the biomass. Okay, that's a good point is you brought up the issue of we had to waste some of the sludge. I'm really glad you made that point. Okay, so over here, when we're talking in terms of activated sludge, we have to get rid of some of the biomass. Otherwise, it accumulates forever. That wouldn't be good. So over here, we also have to have some of the, uh, the solids are going to be removed. And the coating that's on the surface of the, uh, the rocks is going to slough off. And we'll, I'll, I have that word on a, on a future slide, sloughing is what it's called when the, uh, the biomass layer gets too thick and it just sort of just peels off, like the slime falls off of the rock. Now, uh, it is true that with a plastic media, you can have better control over how thick the biomass layer is. And so it's not necessarily that it's like it's easier for the biomass to slough off, but instead it gives us more control as a designer. And the thickness of the biomass layer sometimes has an effect on its performance. And so that's another good advantage of these plastic pellets is that we can be more picky and more targeted on how thick we want the biomass layer to be. Let me give you another hint about 
one of the advantages of plastic instead of using rocks. In the traditional case, those stones, about the, the highest you'd want a trickling filter to be is three meters because the stones are so heavy. And you have to have really uh, strong reinforced concrete walls to keep the, the filter media in place. But in the case of plastic, you don't have to have you know, reinforced concrete walls because the plastic is just so light. And so that allows you to make the filter taller. And remember that as the water trickles through the filter, that's how the, uh, the removal is occurring. The water is going to seep through the stone media. And if it's only going three meters, we have to recirculate it more times. But the taller it is, in the case of plastic, we can go taller, then that just means that you're going to have more removal per round trip through the filter. So it's more efficient. And it's not always pellets. Um, sometimes it can be a mesh, like you see here. Just anything that gives you a high ratio of surface area to volume. Because what we want to provide, the environment we're creating for our biomass, is we want there to be a lot of contact with the biomass and, and the air. You know, we have to deliver essentially three things to the biomass. We have to give it some place to live, oxygen, and substrate. So oxygen, food, and just some place to be. And so the surface, uh, the plastic surface and how polished it is, is going to control the thickness of the, of the biomass layer. And then um, if we have a continuous mesh like this, they can actually sometimes retrofit old rock filters with a uh, just plug and play solution of putting in a continuous mesh and get improved performance right off the bat. Um, sometimes just, you know, there's an infinite number of different permutations of reactors. Uh, they've experimented with hanging sheets of plastic as a location for the biomass to grow on. And so then at the top you can see there's a series of sprayers that spraying the, uh, the water down over the plastic sheets. And then the biomass grows on these sheets and then they slough downward and uh, the water goes out towards the clarifier. In the case of these plastic sheets, sometimes if the layers are so close together, there's just not enough natural air circulation. And so you can see here they're indicating an optional blower. That's just to ensure that there's enough oxygen delivery to the, um, to the biomass. So I wanted to show you a video of a trickling filter in Sweden. And it being in Sweden is kind of uh, actually impressive. It's a testament because sometimes people are critical of trickling filters worried that cold conditions are going to make them less effective. Because when the, when the, uh, when the air gets cold, then the bacteria slow down in the rate that they utilize substrate. But as we know, Sweden is a Scandinavian country. It's very high in latitude, and it gets very cold in Sweden. And so if they can have a, an effective uh, trickling filter in Sweden, and they do, then we can certainly, in most parts in the United States, have trickling filters work OK for us, just you know, so long as we size them appropriately. Okay, so here are just a few key points to emphasize. The microbial film, or the biomass, it's growing on the surface of the media. Um, and with each time the water is uh, sprayed over the surface of the media, the microbes are only taking a small fraction of the waste. It's not like in the trickling filter you have 100% of the substrate at the top and zero at the bottom. In each uh, single cycle that the water goes through the, uh, the trickling filter, it may only remove a small fraction, but through uh, recirculation of the water, you can get a good overall removal. Uh, calling it a trickling filter is sometimes a bit of a misnomer, because it's not physically filtering the contaminant. Uh, it's filter only in sort of conceptual terms. You know, we sometimes think of filtration as screening. You know. Um, contaminated water goes through a really porous, uh, a fine poured filter and it comes out clean. Well, that's not what's happening here because the, uh, the contaminant that we're removing isn't, uh, isn't suspended for one thing. It's a dissolved 
contaminant. And so it's not physical screening that's happening here. And even if it were, the pores or the, the size of the media voids is much too big. And so it's screening only in terms of um, we're pouring water through a media. Um, but as the, uh, the substrate is removed and the bacteria grow, then they're sloughing. And this is what I talked about earlier, how um, just when there's too much slime on the rock or on the plastic pellet, eventually it gets too thick. The gravity, uh, gravitational forces will pull it off of the, um, off of the surface and uh, then a, a new layer will grow. And it's this sloughed off slime layer that is what gets um, settled to the bottom of the clarifier. So we're doing the same thing. We're turning a soluble substrate, which in a million years you can't clarify a soluble substrate by gravity because it's dissolved. By definition, it's not going to settle under gravity. But by having the bacteria consume that dissolved contaminant, then uh, we can settle out the body mass of the bacteria that have grown because you know, that's a settleable solid. And that's removed in the secondary clarifier. Now, this isn't uh, a solution that's always going to be without difficulty. Um, if you have a high organic loading, meaning that you have a, lot, a highly concentrated BOD and a small filter area, then you can have the slime growing so quickly and heavily that the pores can become clogged. And if, if the, uh, the size of the filter media is too small, that's another time that the the pores can get clogged as if you don't have a correct spacing between the uh, filter media. Um, if you're going for natural circulation of oxygen, and it's very important that um, you design that in advance and not just assume that there's going to be natural convection of the oxygen. As sometimes even when you're planning on not having a blower, uh, you sometimes have to put one into place just as a backup to provide oxygen um, especially in hot weather. Um, because in hot weather, in hot weather, oxygen is less soluble in water. But then the other extreme, in cold weather, the microbes are less active and they're, slow, they're more slowly removing the substrate. And so it's extremes in weather that sometimes cause troubles for trickling filters. All right, so let's get into the theory a little bit more of zoom in on the layer, uh, the slime layer, and the filter packing and try and take a look at what's occurring. Uh, there are four things depicted in this slide and what we're ultimately driving at is we want to understand the rate of substrate removal. And so here you can see I've got units of grams per day of removal of substrate per meter of surface area. And so this is a flux. We're talking about how much mass is getting in through a layer of stagnant liquid and to the biomass. Actually, the microbes would consume substrate more quickly, but what's our, our limiting factor, uh, looking at the kinetics of this, what limits how quickly you can remove the BOD is how quickly the water is able to pass the BOD through this stagnant liquid film. And if you have a very thick, liquid film that slows down the mass transfer even further. So this is sort of the actual depiction of what happens. You can see that there's an irregular thickness of the biomass. Now, even if you have a perfectly flat filter media, uh, the biomass grows more quickly in some sections than in others. And so you have sort of a jagged, irregular surface. And what that does is it changes the thickness of the liquid film and it's diffusion of substrate through the liquid film that limits the rate of utilization. Man, hope he doesn't hit a patch of ice. All right, so this is an idealized representation of the same thing. So what's the difference between actual and ideal? We're gonna uh, try and look at mass transfer and we're assuming a constant thickness of the biomass, assuming a constant thickness of this stagnant liquid film. Stagnant means it's not flowing. This is the liquid film that's basically so close to the biomass layer that it's uh, experiencing the no-slip condition, that 
the frictional um, the frictional resistance of flow, the biomass layer is, is staying on the filter packing, and so the water that's flowing across the surface of the biomass right at this interface isn't flowing with any positive velocity. The, the bulk of the liquid flow, the further away we get from the biomass layer, the velocity increases. But right at the interface of the solid, then the shear stress that the solid is applying to the liquid, which is flowing downward, the shear stress is upward to resist the movement, and so that, that's what causes this stagnant liquid film. And so how quickly the substrate passes through the liquid film is what limits the rate of utilization. And there's a brief video that shows the principles of diffusion. Just by dropping a dye of water, a, a dye into water at a couple of different temperatures. So diffusion is the process of a liquid mixing into another liquid just by molecular action and not by it being stirred. And if we put a spoon down into this and started stirring it and moving the spoon around, obviously it would mix much more quickly than it is right now. But what you can see is that it's very slowly spreading out through the liquid, the dye is. And so how quickly the dye spreads into the liquid is kind of a representation of how quickly the substrate is able to diffuse through the stagnant liquid film that's on the surface of the filter media. And so you can see that it's, it's not a quick process. And uh, here in a minute, I think they show the difference between cold water and warm water. And so look at the differences in temperature and how that affects diffusion. In the cold water, the liquid seems to be diffusing more slowly. And because of the temperature differences, it just sort of sinks to the bottom of the container. And so that's another reason why in cold weather, a trickling filter is a little less effective. Not only are the bacteria slower, you know, the kinetics of cellular respiration decreases at a low temperature, but then to make matters worse, the food is getting to the bacteria even more slowly in cold weather because diffusion is lower. We have a slower rate of diffusion when um, the temperature is low. So think about how quickly can the food make it through that liquid film. And that's what's be de being depicted here in this diagram. It's showing here S sub B is the concentration of substrate in the bulk liquid. And the bulk liquid is flowing down because we sprayed the wastewater at the top of the trickling filter and it's flowing down over a surface. In the stagnant layer, there's no movement and so the decrease in concentration is just because the bacteria that are inside of this layer of biomass, they're consuming the BOD that's here in solution and so there's a gradient of the bulk concentration of substrate and then S sub S is just the concentration at the outer layer of the uh, um, of the biomass. And sometimes what we do is we think about this S sub S uh, is similar to the concentration that's coming out of the clarifier or that's coming out of the trickling filter. And so actually we're not able to apply this relationship to uh, design in the same way that we do with activated sludge. You know, when we were going through the kinetics information for activated sludge, that's actually what the design equations are based on, is it's, it's based on the real world uh, application of the rate of biomass growing. But in the case of trickling filter, we, we apply empirical equations that have been developed just because um, it's really hard to accurately model how the concentration decreases as you go downwards into the filter. In this simplification, it's sort of like a, a 2D model instead of a 3D model because we are not able to represent or sort of even think about how S sub B is lower at the bottom of some control volume than it is at the top of the control volume. So 
when I say empiricism here, that just means equations that have been developed based on observations of data rather than based on the application of these rates. All right. So for our in-class exercise, we're going to take a stab at working with this idea of calculating the rate of transfer of substrate through the stagnant film and to the surface of the biomass. All right. There we go. So, what I'd like you to do on this, like usual, you can partner up, get with another student, and uh, the questions that I've asked you, I'm asking in an order that kind of implies what you need to do to be able to solve this problem. Um, I'm going to set the solution out so you can take a look at that to verify what you're doing as you go along. Feel free to look at it. That's not cheating in a in-class exercise like this. And uh, we'll probably take about uh, 15 minutes to go through this in-class exercise and then we'll talk through the solution. If you take a look at a drawing like this, and you think about, if this is a cubic meter, what's the surface area in there? You know, you really have really a lot of surface area, and so that uh, in the in-class exercise, 149, um, 149 square meters per cubic meter of volume, that's, that's a typical value. And actually, that's for rock. That's not even for uh, synthetic plastic media. And the, the plastic media can have a, even a higher specific surface area than the rock media can. So, okay. Well, let's move on. Okay. Aerobic oxidation. Um, one of the points made in the text in uh, section 7.8 is that it's important to pay attention to the microbiology, regardless of whether it's a trickling filter or activated sludge, that if you take a look at what's living in the solution, that can give you an idea of how the system is behaving and uh, how well it's performing. Even if you weren't going to look at uh, like an assay of toxics in the inflow, or if you didn't have dissolved oxygen meters, you still could get a relative idea of where things are at by looking at the microbiology. And it, it specifically mentions protozoa. And uh, a protozoa may be cryptosporidium or giardia. Both of those are sort of famous for being pathogenic to people. They can cause diseases. But there are a lot other kinds of protozoa that will live in uh, wastewater treatment, and they require more than a milligram per liter of dissolved oxygen, but more importantly, they're very sensitive to toxic substances, like if there's discharge from uh, an industrial area. And here in Huntington, we have quite a lot of indis industrial discharges. And so if you typically have protozoa and suddenly they vanish from your wastewater treatment plant, that could potentially be an indicator that some toxic substances have made their way into the treatment system. Now I've got a couple of pictures of uh, three different kinds of worms. And I don't know, it seems a little, and we're in the business of talking about gross stuff this semester, so why not go for worms too? An annelid worm, like pictured here on the left, that's just a common earthworm. It's called a segmented worm. And those can grow in a trickling filter, uh, although they usually wouldn't be present in uh, activated sludge. And the, the reason for the difference is if you look at the environment of a trickling filter, uh, there's more variation in how much oxygen is available. You know, as that rotating arm goes across the media, it's spraying the rocks. And so sometimes the voids will be full of water, but most of the time it isn't. And so a worm like this does need oxygen and probably more than it could get if it was dropped into an aeration basin where it's all liquid. But inside of a trickling filter where most of the time there's air ventilating through the voids, then these worms can grow inside of a uh, uh, trickling filter. 
uh, a flatworm. These are usually parasitic, and this is the sort of worm that can get under people's skin. And um, the reason why it's flat is that a flatworm doesn't have a separate stomach. It actually absorbs substrate and oxygen just through the surface. And so it's flat because it gets its nutrients through diffusion rather than through digestion, uh, like a nematode or an annelid worm does. And the difference between this nematode and the annelid worm is that a nematode uh, isn't segmented, whereas an annelid worm is. It has different segments that do different things. And in fact, you can cut an annelid worm, and there's some redundancy in the life cycle. Uh, you know, what is where. Um, and a nematode just has one continuous digestive tract that goes all the way through the worm. So um, if we look at micro, uh, the, the microbiology, um, an attached growth environment, meaning a trickling filter, that's just a, a more varied environment. It has lots of little microclimates, you could say, inside of the reactor. At the edge of the reactor, there may be some spots that don't get very much water and are especially cool because they're near the edge of the concrete and exposed to the, uh, the surrounding air. Uh, in the center of the reactor, it may be getting more liquid and might be more warm as a result. And so you could have completely different ecology at the center of a trickling filter than you have at the edge or at the surface. And, uh, and as a result, you see different microbiology. Um, this section of the text, section 7.8, also talks about just some of the operational issues that are faced when you are doing secondary treatment. Um, one of the big problems in uh, operating activated sludge is uh, called bulking sludge. And what a bulking sludge is something that won't settle, has poor settling characteristics. And so both of these are pictures of a clarifier. And in a clarifier, remember, we expect the sludge to be heavy enough that the solid particles will settle downward, and then we can collect them off the bottom of the reactor and re-inject it into the aeration basin. Now, in the case of a bulking sludge, if the sludge particles, the solids, don't settle to the bottom, obviously you're going to have a lot of trouble re-injecting it into the aeration basin. And so it's not just annoying. It's not just bad to look at, but it can reduce the concentration of mixed liquor that you're able to um, force into the aeration basin. Now, what causes this bulking sludge is um, bacteria that will get into a chain and form these long string-like chains of bacteria, and then um, oxygen uh, can um, get sort of interspersed and, and entrained in chains of bacteria and it floats to the surface. In a way, it's a little bit like algae. You know, the reason why you see algae at the surface of lakes is because a lot of algae is filamentous and then oxygen is formed when algae is respiring and that causes it to float in a lake. And so this isn't algae, this is bacteria, but it shares the similar characteristic of being long string chains. The way that you measure how well a sludge settles is something called the sludge volume index. And we'll talk about the formula of sludge volume index in, in chapter 8. We'll have to do some calculations related to it. But just to give you a, an early exposure to what is sludge volume index, that is how much volume is occupied by a certain mass of sludge. And what we want is we want sludge to settle so well that it doesn't occupy very much of a volume. We like to have a sludge volume index so that the, the sludge is packed down low at the bottom of the clarifier and not uh, settling poorly. So how do you prevent this operational concern? Um, sometimes the, uh, the issue is as easy as just increasing the dissolved oxygen. So adding more diffusers or increasing the flow rate of air to the diffusers. Um, sometimes it's because the F to M ratio is too low. Who remembers what F and M stand for in this ratio? Very good. Exactly right. So F, the food is the substrate, so BOD concentration is F. And the M, we're talking about the concentration of uh, biomass. So in our formulas, that's X. 
the mixed liquor volatile suspended solids. And so what you need to do is give it more food because uh, oftentimes you'll see bulking sludge when there's too much microorganisms for not enough food. Um, sometimes it happens because the nutrient balance gets out of whack, like there's not enough nitrogen or phosphorus. And uh, it can also be related to grease and pH. So it's just uh, usually you can make small changes in inflow characteristics and avoid bulking sludge. Now foaming, on the other hand, is a lot more difficult to control. Uh, the book is talking about how foaming is a biological process, and there's lots of different bacteria that will cause foaming. One of the more um, well-known is nocardia. It causes foaming. There are others that are more common, but nocardia foam is famous because the foam that nocardia can generate can be very thick. Um, and so to avoid this biological process from occurring, sometimes it's happening because the solid's retention time is too high. And remember, in an activated sludge, we have two kinds of retention time. There's the hydraulic retention time. Um, that is just how long is the water spending inside of this as it flows through the aeration basin and the clarifier and then exits. So the hydraulic retention time is one thing, but the solid, since they're recirculating, the SRT is usually much longer than the hydraulic retention time. And so if the SRT is too high, that favors some of the uh, bacteria that cause foaming. Another thing that's, select, that's suggested for controlling foaming is what they call selectors. <laughs> and this is the idea, um, like what's the old saying, like they had rats on an island and so they released a ferret. And then the ferret kills the rats, but now there's too many ferrets and so they release dogs. And the dog get the ferrets, but now the dogs are uh, tearing up the grass and the species. And, well, anyways, a selector is a bacteria that will kill the nocardia or, you know, it's, it's some sort of another microorganism that's going to prey on whatever um, microbes are causing the unwanted foaming. So since this is a controlled environment, it's not, you know, Earth's ecology. So we don't have to be as worried about things getting out of balance in a wastewater treatment plant as we do as, say, you know, they really don't want to release a foreign species onto, uh, you know, Hawaii. They don't want to introduce uh, uh, invasive species there. So, you know, this is already our engineered environment. So we don't have to have the same anxiety about introducing selectors. But that's what it is. A selector is just a different bacteria that will compete uh, and will eventually outcompete the uh, bacteria that cause problems. All right. So the last thing we're going to be talking about tonight, we're going to spend the rest of our time on this, is um, uh, nitrification and denitrification. And it's, it's one of the really interesting ideas in wastewater treatment. I think, like, the first really big interesting idea that we talked about this semester was recirculating sludge. And that's something that was only invented about 100 years ago. Before that, nobody really knew how to remove all the BOD from wastewater. Uh, luckily, it wasn't too much of a problem because, you know, more than 100 years ago, there weren't a lot of concentrated populations. And so they could just dump their raw sewage into a river and it didn't cause as much problems as it would nowadays because our populations are a lot more urbanized and concentrated now. So thankfully, the first big idea of recirculating that activated sludge uh, really gave us a big leg up on removing BOD. So nitrification, denitrification is the other really big idea that we'll get a chance to start talking about tonight. And the, uh, the idea behind this is that nitrogen is another pollutant. It's actually a direct pollutant. And, um, at the beginning of the semester, I was telling you that BOD isn't a direct pollutant. It's, it's kind of the damage it does is indirect because when you add the BOD, the oxygen concentration goes down in a receiving body and it's the consequence of oxygen demand that causes the trouble. It's not necessarily pouring sugar in the river. The sugar isn't a problem. It's the effect that's the problem. Well, that's the opposite of here. Here, the nitrogen 
is actually problematic for the species that come in contact with it. Ammonia is toxic to fish and other aquatic organisms. So that's one of the reasons why we need to remove dissolved nitrogen from wastewater before we discharge it. So it's bad for fish, but nitrogen is actually good and stimulates vegetative growth. Has anybody heard of this word before that I'm pointing at? Anybody know what that is? Eutrophic? What does it mean? What is it? Over, over nitrated? That's, that's the effect of it. Um, eutrophic means that you're stimulating growth too much. Uh, in a lake, if you have a lake and you pour in lots of fertilizer, then the algae will grow very quickly. And cattails and weeds will grow very quickly. Unfortunately, my parents have this problem. On their property in Ohio, they have a, a small lake near their house, but next to the lake is a farm. And the, the, the farmer is always putting on tons and tons of nitrogen fertilizer because he alternates one year as soybeans, one year as corn. One year as soybeans, one year as corn. And the only way to keep that up is adding lots of fertilizer. The fertilizer will run off the soil and gets into the lake, and then the same thing that's stimulating growth in the crops also will stimulate growth in the water. And so <clears throat> nitrogen speeds up the life cycle of plant growth. And so eutrophic conditions means a lake that has too much nutrients in it. And um, so we want to avoid that. You sometimes maybe hear about red tide in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, red tide is a growth of algae, it's actually toxic algae, that's stimulated by all of the nutrients that get into the Gulf of Mexico by the Mississippi River. You know, the Midwest of the United States is a very productive agricultural region. You've got the Missouri River, the Ohio River, lots of rivers, and all of that fertilizer that get, gets added to the surface is draining through the river system into the Gulf of Mexico, and it causes uh, algae growth in the Gulf. So we have to remove and control how much nitrogen is getting into the environment. And then also, you can't have nitrogen if the water is going to be reused. For example, if we recycle wastewater and use it for irrigation. You know, there are some places where they are using treated wastewater to water plants, um, for watering the grass, and even a handful of places, Singapore comes to mind, where they're actually drinking it. You know, in, the, in the small country of Singapore, they have a, new, a system called New Water, where they go all the way from wastewater to a bottle. Um, so in that situation, you can't have too much nitrogen in drinking water. For example, nitrate has an MCL, a maximum contaminant level, of 10 milligrams per liter for, uh, for nitrate. And typically, wastewater will have between 25 and 45 milligrams per liter. And it can be even as high as 200 milligrams per liter. So you have to remove a lot of nitrogen to make the water okay for the environment or okay for drinking. Here's just a diagram that's showing nitrogen when it is uh, as ammonia. If you pour ammonia into water, the ammonia will <coughs> speciate into the ammonium ion, NH4+. And I'm going to show you a video in a moment that talks about that speciation of the ammonium ion. Before we look at that video, <clears throat> let's just re-familiarize us with ourselves with some terms. Probably you've already heard these terms lots of times in the past in a chemistry class as an undergraduate. Uh, maybe you've already taken Environmental Engineering 615 with Dr. McCormick, the uh, Environmental Chemistry class. I'm sure that you went over these terms with him, if you did. Um, oxidize means to combine with oxygen. And oxygen is electronegative, which means it's, in many cases, going to try and, in a, in a bonding relationship, the oxygen will be taking electrons from another element. So oxidation is the process of an element losing its electrons when some other chemical is bonding with oxygen. 
Now, in our case, what we're talking about, this is all about nitrogen. The rest of our class period is about nitrogen. So when nitrogen is oxidized, bacteria are doing the work. What bacteria are doing is they're going to oxidize the nitrogen in ammonia. So uh, the nitrogen is going to lose electrons during the oxidation. And then later on, the nitrogen is going to be reduced during denitrification. Reduction is when an atom is gaining its electrons. So in this process of redox, or reduction and oxidation, one of the chemical species is an electron donor, and another one is an electron acceptor. So hopefully that brings back some memories of the past. We've already been exposed to oxidation reduction. Now, here is a diagram that's very, very important. You should be able to recreate this diagram. Maybe in the notes, put a little star and say memorize. You need to be able to memorize this, what's happening. And there's not that much going on here. So um, <clears throat> nitrification is where the raw ammonia, in this case, it's expressed as the ammonium ion. This is what comes into the wastewater treatment plant, just NH4+. Plus. That's ammonia in water. There's going to be an ammonia oxidizing bacteria, AOB, does the reaction from NH4 to NO2 minus. This is nitrite. And then nitrite gets oxidized into nitrate by an NOB, a nitrite oxidizing bacteria. So both of these steps is an oxidation step. So if we look at what is the charge that N has, now H always has plus one, right? So NH4, there's going to be four positives there. And if the overall thing has a net positive charge of plus one, that means the N is minus three to begin with. So look at how does the charge of nitrogen change? It starts as minus three here. And then in the nitrite, the N here has a charge of plus 5. And then after it goes through the final step of nitritication, it becomes nitrate. And it's plus 5 in the end, in the end of nitrification. Now, what has been the oxidizing agent in all of this? Well, oxygen started off as zero charge, and it goes to minus 2. So nitrification is the first step. And then once we have nitrite, nitrate, it goes to nitrogen gas, which is inert. And we love to have this ammonia, which is very toxic to wildlife and is bad for humans as well. If you can get that to go to nitrogen gas, which is 80% of our atmosphere, it's totally safe once it goes into nitrogen gas. And so this is a really amazing process that takes a dangerous pollutant into something that just eventually gets into the atmosphere. And it's totally safe at the end. And it's bacteria that are doing all the work for us. And so we're going to, in a little bit, talk about how do we configure reactors to make this uh, bacterial reaction happen. Uh, but before we look at the different types of reactors that do it, let's look at this video. I just discovered this video today, and I'm really excited to watch the whole thing. I scanned through it and I think it's going to do a great job helping us understand. Much like carbon, nitrogen follows a basic pathway in a continuous cycle. This cycle is critical to all living organisms that have existed or will exist on the planet. Wastewater treatment plants play a critical role in reintroducing nitrogen back into this cycle with limited environmental impact. High levels of nitrogen entering natural waterways can result in toxic conditions for wildlife, dissolved oxygen depletion, and excessive algae growth, all harmful to local plant, animal, and human populations. Nitrogen enters wastewater through various pathways. The most abundant contributor of nitrogen in typical municipal wastewater is urea. Yeah urine. Other contributors of nitrogen are food processing waste, chemical cleaning agents, and many other industrial components. Nitrogen is present in wastewater in various forms, which have been lumped into separate general categories. 
Nitrogen in the form of ammonia is ammonia nitrogen. There is also nitrite nitrogen and nitrate nitrogen, which are usually formed during the actual biological processes at the wastewater treatment plant. In addition to these forms, nitrogen makes up a small percentage of the cell mass of the organisms in the system, as well as other dissolved organic compounds. This category is referred to as organic nitrogen, of which a certain amount typically cannot be removed through the biological processes that will be described in this video. Total nitrogen, as the name implies, is the sum of all types of nitrogen. TKN, or total Kaldal nitrogen, named after the scientist Johann Kaldal, is the sum of only organic nitrogen and ammonia nitrogen. TIN, or total inorganic nitrogen, is just as the name implies, the total nitrogen minus the organic nitrogen. In simplistic terms, nitrogen in various forms is flushed, rinsed, or otherwise introduced into the sewer system. Almost all of this organic nitrogen, urea for example, is immediately hydrolyzed into ammonia. In water, gaseous ammonia, NH3, is almost entirely converted to ionized ammonia, or ammonium, NH4+. Specialized autotrophic bacteria, or nitrifiers, convert the ammonium to nitrite, NO2, and then to nitrate, NO3, through various biological processes. As dissolved oxygen is depleted by the nitrifiers and other organisms in the basin, other specialized heterotrophic bacteria, denitrifiers, are able to thrive by using the oxygen attached to the nitrate molecules for respiration, creating nitrogen gas as a byproduct. The nitrogen gas then simply bubbles out of the water into the atmosphere. Pretty slick, right? Well, let's go back to the beginning and take a closer look at each of these important steps in the nitrogen removal process. First, as a natural reaction in an aqueous solution, or in water, the vast majority of the organic nitrogen immediately hydrolyzes into ammonia. Most of this ammonia automatically converts to the ionic form, ammonium. The equilibrium between the gaseous and ionic forms of ammonia is heavily impacted by the pH of the water. A more acidic solution will favor the ionic form, ammonium. A more basic will favor the gaseous form, ammonia. Since wastewater typically ranges between a pH of 6 and 9, almost all of the ammonia will be in the ionic form. Since ammonia testing accounts for both forms, ionic and gaseous, it is not necessary to worry about each form separately. No bacteria is necessary for this conversion, it just happens. The next step in the process consists of converting ammonium to nitrite and then nitrate. This two-step process is usually lumped into one term, nitrification. This step is facilitated by a specialized autotrophic bacteria. So what does autotrophic mean? There are two broad categories for how organisms obtain carbon required for growth, autotrophs and heterotrophs. Autotrophs are able to obtain their carbon from non-organic sources, such as carbon dioxide and the alkaline bicarbonate. Plants are good examples of how this is done. Heterotrophs, on the other hand, require organic sources of carbon. Essentially, heterotrophs get carbon by consuming other organic compounds, humans and animals being good examples. In contrast to heterotrophic VOD consuming bacteria, autotrophic nitrifiers require more time to mature and maintain their population in a biological wastewater treatment system. The nitrifiers dictate the SRT in nitrogen reducing plants. How fast nitrifiers grow depends on the temperature of the wastewater and the amount of dissolved oxygen present. If nitrifiers aren't allowed enough time to thrive, you run the risk of accidentally wasting them out of the system entirely and losing nitrification. Higher temperatures and DO concentrations means faster growth. Colder temperatures and lower DO concentrations means slower growth. Also, when no DO is present, nitrifiers can become completely inactive. <laughs> As a note, it is important to remember that nitrifiers are also quite sensitive to pH, tending to function most comfortably in water with a pH between 6.8 and 7.5. Once a healthy population of nitrifiers has developed in your system, the first step, performed largely by a group of bugs known as ammonia oxidizers, will take the ammonium and DO and convert it into acid, water, nitrite, and energy. If your system doesn't have adequate alkalinity, the acid produced here could create inhospitably acidic conditions for the bacteria, resulting in major process hiccups, including loss of nitrification. The water produced is absorbed in the system, the nitrate moves on to the next step, and the energy is used by the bacteria to grow and multiply. The second step, for which a group of bugs known as nitrite oxidizers is largely responsible, takes that nitrite and more DO and converts it into nitrate and energy. This conversion from ammonia to nitrate is nitrification. Typically, full nitrification is observed, 
when ammonia concentrations are reduced to less than two milligrams per liter and nitrite concentrations to less than half a milligram per liter. As mentioned, nitrification is a very oxygen-hungry process. As a comparison, in order to remove one pound of BOD, 1.2 pounds of oxygen are required. However, to reduce one pound of ammonia to nitrate, 4.6 pounds of oxygen are required. Since getting dissolved oxygen into wastewater is a very energy-intensive process, it would benefit every treatment plant's electrical bill if they didn't aerate more than they needed to. Over-aerating does nothing to improve the process. It really is flushing money down the toilet. After nitrification, the nitrogen is still in the system, mostly as part of the bugs and in the form of nitrate. Though not as toxic as ammonia, nitrates can still contribute to eutrophication and if released into a source supplying drinking water, can endanger human populations, specifically infants, causing what is known as blue baby syndrome by interfering with blood oxygenation. The final step in completely removing nitrogen from the system is called denitrification. Since nitrification is converting ammonia to nitrate, one could think that denitrification is simply the reversal of this process. Confusingly, yet fortunately, this is not the case. Denitrification is performed by a specialized heterotrophic bacteria. These guys require some pretty specific conditions to perform this step. First of all, they need some food, or BOD. In order to oxidize that food, they need oxygen. Their easiest and first choice for oxygen is DO. If there is no DO present, however, they look to alternative sources, such as nitrate. These specialists have the ability to strip the oxygen from nitrate molecules to satisfy their needs. This critical environment where DO is not present, yet nitrates are, is referred to as anoxic, and is absolutely required for denitrification. These bugs take the BOD and nitrate to produce energy, base, and nitrogen gas. The base is actually very useful in buffering the acid produced during nitrification. The nitrogen gas then floats in tiny bubbles to the surface and into the atmosphere. Though great in the biological basin, denitrification in a clarifier can result in undesirable floating sludge. There are many alternative strategies for developing anoxic conditions. Some treatment plants are designed to have dedicated anoxic zone volumes in the flow chart, while others strive to develop these anoxic zones within the oxidation ditch or aeration zone by rigidly controlling aeration or by turning off aerators for set periods of time. Additionally, under certain conditions, micro-anoxic zones can be developed within the bacterial flocks themselves, resulting in what is referred to as simultaneous nitrification denitrification. Various levels of denitrification may be required depending on the local discharge permit. However, full biological denitrification typically results in only one to three milligrams of nitrate in the effluent stream. Now, let's take a look at some real life operational scenarios. During your routine operational sampling, you notice that the ammonia in the effluent is beginning to rise above one All to three right. milligrams per liter. I don't think we'll let's do these operational scenarios, but Man, I really, really like that video. I mean, that, they need to get the Academy Award for wastewater videos. Um, that one was really good. <clears throat> A lot to take in, though. He was talking quickly, right? So let's just review some of the ideas that were presented there. Um, so it's a multi-step process. There's some bacteria that take the ammonium and turn it into nitrite and then different bacteria that take nitrite to nitrate. And one thing that he mentioned is that acid is generated during this process. And so this H plus is going to uh, turn into an acid. And so it's consuming alkalinity. Alkalinity is defined as the quantitative capacity to uh, buffer an acid. So you know, um, dissolved uh, carbonate or um, uh, alkalinity can be consumed in the form of the OH that he was talking about during denitrification. So one thing to keep in mind is that if the alkalinity is low of the water that's being treated, then the pH can change during nitrification. Um, and in addition to all of this, there are some trace nutrients that are required during nitrification as well. So when nitrification is accomplished in a single stage, uh, what we're trying to do is have both BOD removal and nitrification in the same aeration basin. Now, remember that 
this is a two-step process. There's nitrification and then later on there's denitrification. We couldn't have denitrification in here because as the video is mentioning, denitrification requires anoxic conditions. And so in this aeration basin, there wouldn't be any anoxic conditions. Maybe, potentially, there could be anoxic conditions at the bottom of the clarifier, possibly. But all we're focusing on so far is the conversion of ammonia into nitrate. Um, in, this, in this single stage nitrification, it's a slow process. Nitrification is slow, and so if you have a single stage process like this, then the aeration basin has to be relatively large. And to avoid that, uh, to avoid having a unnaturally large aeration basin, sometimes they'll instead use a two-stage suspended growth nitrate, uh, nitrification. So um, the, uh, the benefit of a two-stage operation like this is that BOD is removed in the first stage, and it can happen at a much faster rate than nitrification. And so this first aeration basin doesn't need to be as large. And then the second aeration basin focuses mostly on nitrification. And so it, it's not that the, uh, in the, in the case of this first aeration basin, there's different bacteria competing with each other at the same time. Because if you have a single stage, the bacteria that break down BOD are trying to exist in the same environment as the bacteria that are converting ammonium into nitrate. And so that's not an ideal arrangement. In this case, you can have a more specialized environment and keeping the two different species of bacteria separate allows you to control different recycle rates. Because you see in both, both of these instances, there's a return of activated sludge. And so by keeping the, solu uh, the soluble BOD removal and the nitrogen removal separate here, you can have independent recycle rates. You can have different aeration rates so that you don't have to have a wasted uh, amount of aeration. You know, as it said in the video, that it just is increasing your electric bill if you over aerate the, uh, the bacteria. And so it gives you a lot more flexibility to have a, a two-stage suspended growth. And then the even more fancy version of two-stage suspended growth nitrification is what's sometimes known as an AB process. Now, in an AB process like this, here is an anoxic chamber before nitrification. So in this case, having a pre-anoxic chamber, as it's known as, before nitrification, it kind of primes the bacteria for a quicker uptake of nitrogen later on. Um, if you starve bacteria for a while, then they're going to be even more aggressive in consuming the substrate once they get the opportunity. And so that anoxic mixed chamber here is, uh, for one thing, it's doing perhaps a, a little bit of denitrification because it's an anoxic environment. But then the bacteria who aren't denitrifiers, who are instead focusing on nitrification, enter the aeration basin for nitrification uh, even more aggressive in removing the ammonia. Um, so just a bit of information about kinetics here. Um, there is a sort of a transition zone where the, uh, the conversion of ammonia into nitrate is what's fastest until you get up to 28 degrees Celsius. But when you get above 28 degrees Celsius, then uh, that's not the rate limiting state, uh, step any longer. The, uh, remember that, let's go back to our main chart, this one that you're supposed to memorize. It's a two-step process. First, ammonia to nitrate. At nitrite, and then nitrite to nitrate. And so what we're saying, saying here in kinetics is that up until 28 degrees Celsius, it's the first one that's rate limiting. The slower process is the AOB. But up through, uh, up once we get beyond 28 degrees Celsius, then you have to consider the kinetics of both of those parallel reactions. Um, 
And then the other thing is just ensuring that there's enough dissolved oxygen. And so uh, getting any more than between 3 or 4 milligrams per liter of oxygen is kind of wasteful in nitrification because above that concentration, there's no additional removal. The, the rate increases as you're increasing up until 3 to 4. But if you have, if you're going to, trying to maintain 10 milligrams per liter of dissolved oxygen, you're not going to get any additional benefit than if it was only up to 4. But below 0.5 milligrams per liter, the reaction of nitrite to nitrate, which is the second of those reactions, is inhibited more than ammonia to nitrite. And so you'd have uh, an accumulation of nitrate, uh, I'm sorry, you'd have an accumulation of nitrite if the DO is too low. Uh, some of the other environmental factors that was mentioning in the video is that there's an optimal pH range that happens to coincide with the typical pH for wastewater. So it's a happy coincidence that you know you can get good nitrification at typical pH ranges. You're not having to uh, to increase or decrease the pH unless the solution isn't well buffered. If there's uh, not a, not enough alkalinity, then nitrification can suffer uh, because of the acid that's added in the first step. Um, but one thing that you have to be aware of when it comes to the toxic materials is that the same organic materials that can slow down BOD removal also can inhibit the nitrification. And so nitrification uh, is a very sensitive process uh, that th those organisms are killed off more quickly than the organisms that are utilizing BOD. Um, metals like that would come from maybe here in Huntington we have several uh, small-scale smelters and they have uh, special metals which they used to call the nickel plant. I don't have any idea what the wastewater is coming from there. I imagine it's, um, it may even have its own wastewater treatment before it comes into Huntington's network, but uh, it doesn't require very much metals before the ammonia oxidation is inhibited. If you look at the concentrations of this, even as low as 0.1 milligrams per liter of copper, is enough to completely inhibit uh, the nitrification. And that's lower than the drinking water MCL. So if you think about that for a second, drinking water can have up to 1.3 milligrams per liter. So it's safe for humans, but the bacteria that are converting ammonia can only stand 0.1 milligrams per liter of copper. Um, so that gives you an idea of how sensitive they really are to, uh, to metals. All right, so now we'll talk about the second stage of that two-step process. I guess it's more than a two-step process because even the first step is a two-step process. We go back to this table. There's nitrification, then denitrification. And within nitrification, there's two steps. There's ammonia to nitrite nitrite to nitrate. And in an exam, I, I think it would be a, a pretty fair question for me to say, write the chemical formula for nitrate. And then you'd need to know that nitrate is NO3 minus. Or you'd need to know that nitri nitrite is NO2 minus. Um, so it's two stages within nitrification and then the, the processing of nitrate into nitrogen. Um, so in denitrification, what we're going to be focusing on is the conversion of these two constituents, nitrite and nitrate, into nitrogen gas. Now only a little bit. It's a very slow process from nitrite directly to nitrogen gas. They're showing that there is a way for it to go from nitrite directly to nitrogen gas but it's far more common instead the preferred route is from nitrite to nitrate and then from nitrate to nitrogen gas. And so the, the main route is ammonia nitrogen, nitrite, nitrate, and then nitrogen gas through denitrification. So 
if you follow what is the charge of nitrogen through this step, remember that in ammonia, nitrogen has what charge? If it's NH3, then what is the charge of nitrogen when it's as ammonia? Right. So it's negative 3. Ammonia, uh, the nitrogen is negative 3 here. What's the charge of nitrogen when it's in nitrite? Positive 3. And then positive 5 when it gets to nitrate. And then when it gets into nitrogen gas, it's back to 0. And so all of these first steps, when we were at uh, negative, positive, positive, what we're doing is we're taking away electrons. And now in the final step of denitrification, we're adding electrons to get it back to a charge of zero. So denitrification is an anoxic process. They, they showed a couple of different little diagram of bugs in that video that we watched. And the, the last bug was like the really big, sort of chunky one. And it was showing that as a bug that likes, well, it doesn't necessarily like anoxic conditions. It's that it can handle anoxic conditions. It made the point that it prefers oxygen. The microbes that are going to uh, break down nitrate, break down nitrate because there's, nothing, there's no other source of, uh, of oxygen available. And so it's going after the nitrate because there isn't dissolved oxygen. And so in what's called a pre-anoxic denitrification, we have return activated sludge being added here to get a nice concentration of, uh, of microbial mass. But then in this case, you're also having a parallel recirculation of just the liquid from the aerobic zone into an anoxic zone. And by having the nitrate feed, just some of the water that is this in the aerobic zone, it's already experienced the nitrification reaction. So the ammonia is being converted to nitrate here in the aerobic zone, re-injecting a portion of it into the anoxic, which just means there's no aeration, then that is where the denitrification is going to occur. And denitrification, we can say that it's, I put fast in quotes, it's actually you know, not literally fast, but in this, this particular configuration, it's happening faster than it would otherwise because there's BOD available. Remember, they said that you know, these microbes do need food, and sometimes we actually have to add artificial BOD to try and help the denitrification reaction. You can add acetate or methanol in denitrification uh, just to make sure that there's enough substrate available for the microbes that are living in the uh, anoxic basin. That's not necessary here in what's known as an NLE reactor. But in a post-anoxic denitrification, um, what you'll see is that there's aerobic, and in the aerobic phase, it's breaking down BOD, and it's also um, going to be converting nitrate, uh, ammonia into nitrate, and then in, in the anoxic zone, it's going from nitrate into um, nitrogen gas. And the problem here, having it post-anoxic, is that now the carbon source is reduced, and so there isn't as much BOD, there isn't a substrate available, so sometimes they'll add an external carbon source to increase the rate of denitrification inside of the anoxic basin. And this is sometimes known as endogenous denitrification. And uh, again, this is a summary of the different charges that nitrogen has as it goes through uh, the steps on the way to nitrogen gas. The nitrate reduction and um, the alkalinity is produced in the denitrification. So remember, alkalinity was consumed. And did I say the quantity of alkalinity consumed? Uh, how much alkalinity? Yeah, here it is. 
seven grams of alkalinity as uh, calcium carbonate per gram of nitrogen converted. So in the first step, in nitrification, we need seven grams of alkalinity for every gram of nitrogen. We get some of that back, not all. If it required seven to begin with, then during denitrification, we get back 3.6 grams of alkalinity for every gram of nitrate nitrogen that's reduced into uh, nitrogen gas. And so the net difference is if we needed 7 and we're getting back 3.6, we need about need to add 3.4 grams of alkalinity for every gram of nitrogen that's removed. And they said that typical concentrations of ammonia may be are in the ballpark of like 20, uh, 20 grams per cubic meter. So it can consume a fair amount of alkalinity during uh, the nitrification, denitrification. In the video, it showed some of the uh, recirculating plug flow type reactors. It showed that top view, and it's similar in concept to what's shown here, that you have water that's going through some sort of a racetrack configuration. Well, let me pull up in that video again where it was showing the overhead view. Here it is. So it'll show an overhead in just a moment. All right, so the water is going around in circles here. It's a plug flow reactor that's recirculating. In some of it, you can see it's very aerated. And then here, in this section, they're not adding air. And so some of it is aerated, some of it is not. And that is the basic idea behind simultaneous nitrification, denitrification, is that if you have it recirculating around, then you could add an aerator at one end of the reactor. And by the time the water is at the other side of the reactor, maybe the dissolved oxygen concentration is low. And so if you have an aerator on one end, that this would be where the nitrification occurs. And as the water recirculates around, maybe all of the oxygen is consumed at this point. And so then denitrification occurs in the other section of the reactor. And so within one reactor, you have simultaneous nitrification and then denitrification. But that's not the only place you can have simultaneous nitrification, denitrification. And the video also mentioned that within a flock, you can have maybe at the center of a cluster of, uh, of bacteria. The bacteria that are stuck in the middle are far away from the dissolved oxygen because the dissolved oxygen is in the water and some of, it, some of the dissolved oxygen will get to the bacteria at the surface. And so the bacteria that are on the surface of the flock are doing the nitrification. And then the bacteria that are at the center of the flock are sort of surrounded on all sides and they're not getting as much oxygen and so in the center they're doing the denitrification which is the anoxic reaction of converting nitrate into nitrogen. Okay. Any questions about nitrification? All right. Well, let me encourage you to uh, really Take the time to go through section 7.9 and 7.10. 7.9 is nitrification, 7.10 is denitrification, and having a good conceptual understanding of that process will be important for the exam. There isn't a, another homework assignment assigned. The next thing that's actually on your to-do list is going to be the exam on Wednesday, March 11th. So we've got two weeks for you to brush up on where we've been so far to uh, re, sort of re-expose yourself to the ideas of lecture seven, uh, section 7 through 10. Um, but if you want to go through the solutions on MU Online and have any questions, please feel free to stop by my office. You know, they're just posted right on Blackboard. So here we've got homework 2, homework 3, and so on. And uh, with that, I hope you have a great evening, and I will see you next Wednesday.